Hi everyone, welcome to this new review on the Needle Drop. This is the brand new format that we're going to go with in the reviews here. Uh, the reviews are posted onto my forehead and then you just basically sit here and read them off my forehead while I sit here in silence so that it will be easier for you to read. My Anthony Reed, Reed Tano, Tano here, the internet's busiest music nerd, and it's time for a classic review of David Bowie's The Rise and Fall of Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars. Gotta say the full title, guys. The late and the great Mr. David Bowie, multi-instrumentalist, producer, singer-songwriter, his untimely death rocked the music industry earlier this year, not only because we lost one of the most iconic figures in modern music, but also the album that coincided with his death, Black Star. The album was very much about it, Bowie's death, his spirit, the afterlife, his fame, his memory in the public eye. If you want to hear me talk about this album, there is an album review of this LP on YouTube. I will most likely link it at the end of this video as well. But I thought I would take this Classics Week opportunity, since we lost David Bowie in the first half of this year, to talk about uh, his most popular album, Yeah. Now this record is a part of several notable phases in David Bowie's career. We have the early years, which showcased a lot of Baroque pop and a lot of folk influences. Later down the road in the late 70s and the early 80s, we would hear a lot of pop rock, art rock, experimental rock. But in the early and mid 70s, Ziggy Stardust here is considered to be the pinnacle of David Bowie's glam rock era. Pairing with albums such as Aladdin Sane and The Man Who Sold the World, as well as Hunky Dory, the album that directly preceded this one. Not a perfect album. It does have the song Kooks on it. <laughs> Please don't kill me. But an important record, all the same, because it did set the foundation for what was to come. On this record, you could catch these very theatrical and incredibly catchy rock songs with prominent lead guitars that are very sharp and melodic, as well as some wonderful and rich pianos that are kind of playful and jumpy. This album featured iconic David Bowie singles such as Changes. Other tracks were direct references to artists who David Bowie drew an incredible amount of influence and inspiration from. David Bowie, uh, an artist who always wore his influences on his sleeve. Uh, we have a tribute to Bob Dylan on this album. Andy Warhol as well. And the song Queen Bitch is deeply inspired by Lou Reed and the Velvet Underground. The Baroque and folk influences on this record still come through on cuts like Quicksand, but there is one track on Hunky Dory that is incredibly important to take note of considering the themes of Ziggy Stardust, and that is the song Life on Mars. It ends at a question mark. You gotta say it like a question. And the theme that I'm talking about here is space. At this point, David Bowie had long been obsessed with space as a theme in his art. I mean, one of his big breakout singles, uh, Space Oddity, can't, can't forget that. And Life on Mars uh, isn't so much about life on Mars. Instead, it uses Mars as an escape or just an idea of an escape, away from the mundane struggles and cliched commercial art of planet Earth. It only makes sense that a song that would make such a statement would be wrapped in just lavish arranged instrumentation and be just instrumentally grand and showy, kind of like a peacock. Anyway, he explores these themes of rock and roll and space and fame through these really ambitious instrumentals and inventive characters. And while Ziggy Stardust may not be as heavy and punchy and instrumentally crisp as the follow-up album Aladdin Sane, which was dropped just a, a year later. It's really the themes and the concept of Ziggy Stardust that, that makes this album such a, a, a seminal record for Bowie. The record kicks off not only with some beautiful pianos and some very 
dramatic vocals from David Bowie, but also with a storyline that sounds like it's ripped straight out of a sci-fi movie, and that is that essentially the Earth is dying and it has five years left to live. The track has this gentle groove in 3-4, these beautiful piano and string crescendos that sort of get dissonant and chaotic at the end with David Bowie's vocals just shouting and going crazy. And the lyrics have this rush of nostalgia, like David Bowie's life is just kind of flashing before his eyes and he's thinking about all these things that he's gonna miss. Some of these things are very mundane, everyday stuff. Whether it be boys and toys and TVs and electric irons, all of these things he feels like he needs to stash away way in his mind. His mind, he compares it to a warehouse and it's all cluttered and he needs to jam everything in there because everything is literally about to be erased from the face of the earth. And there's so many things going on lyrically in the track. I mean, there are references to everyday life as well as political jabs like when a cop sort of kisses the feet of a preacher and David Bowie says that this causes a nearby queer to throw up. The entire track is just a, a mural with numerous characters and, and things going on at once. It's a beautiful open to the record and sort of gives the album a, a very doomy and gloomy uh, <laughs> tone, but it deviates from it really quickly once the song Soul Love pops in, which is a very lovely love song, very sensual and smooth. But with Bowie's very odd and doubled singing voice on the track, it almost sounds like he's an alien being beamed down from another planet to deliver a message of peace and love. Set to some saxophone and some springy hand percussion and uh, some very tinny acoustic guitar. And while it is a love song, I think it avoids uh, a lot of the cliches of the love songs of the day because Bowie sings about love in this very abstract and philosophical sense. We get into the song Moonage Daydream, which is a little more eventful, not only because I think it gets back into the concept, the narrative of the record, but it features these punchy guitars, loud, blaring, great drum fills, one of David Bowie's most iconic opening lyrics. I'm a mama papa coming for you! Which might have been his way of censoring himself from saying the word motherfucker, not totally sure. This track, in a sense, is also an introduction to the Ziggy Stardust character, uh, even though the track itself predates this album. Still though, Bowie portrays himself as a space invader who is leaving quite the impression on Earth's population. Uh, he seems almost like this object of infatuation, or he wants to be anyway, especially when the chorus comes around and he's saying, keep your electric eye on me. And I know if we take the narrative of this record and we look at it just on the surface, Ziggy is supposed to be coming down and saving the world from this uh, five-year oblivion that it's going to be suffering. But uh, this track and the album itself is, is really more of a statement on fame and attention and wanting attention. And there are other interpretations that people can pull from this track, but that attention, that fame narrative becomes more and more apparent as the album progresses. Now, I don't want to leave this track before saying that I love the instrumental here. The guitar solo passage is fantastic. The psychedelic effects on the vocals are wonderful. The strings get totally wild toward the end of the cut. The horns and flute passage in the middle of the track is beautiful too. In a way, I see Bowie portraying himself on this track as an artist or a figure who, if he had the platform, if he had the opportunity, he could leave a real impact on people, leave a real impression on people. And that feeling is kind of confirmed on the song Starman, where Bowie literally sings about the Starman being in the sky and he would like to come down, but he feels like if he does and he exposes us to these new ideas and sounds and whatever, he'll blow our minds. In his own art, David Bowie is telling us that he feels like he has something special to offer, something that's going to uh, leave a mark on musical and artistic history. And maybe it's this mark, it's this uh, uh, new set of ideas that he's sort of uh, given us that uh, have actually ended up saving the world from this five-year peril that he's singing about earlier. On the song It Ain't Easy, uh, we 
deviate from the narrative of the album again because the track is essentially a cover song of a Ron Davies track, which is a actually a very soulful and wonderful country song that dropped in 1970. It has a really plucky acoustic guitar intro as well. David Bowie's rendition here is much heavier, punchier. His very yelpy vocal delivery on the cut, I imagine, could have left a strong impression on like a young Jack White. But once we get into the song Lady Stardust, we have David Bowie reflecting on image once again. Now in respect to glam rock and specifically Mark Bolin of T-Rex who the song references. He was notorious for his performance makeup and his long black hair and uh, like sort of this star man that David Bowie was singing about earlier, he is this artistic, he is this rock and roll figure who close-minded people are just baffled by. So in a way David Bowie is kind of commenting on this new wave of expression in rock music and the way that the public is kind of interpreting it. And then you have to consider the themes on this album and in glam rock in general that dealt in homosexuality because glam rock was home to many superstars that were either gay or bisexual or used the characters they would play on stage to bend gender. What I find so interesting about this record is just how popular it still is and I attribute that mostly to the music of the album which is wonderful, it's beautiful, it's awesomely produced glam rock music uh, with great detailed lavish instrumentation but when we dive into the lyrics of the album they're very dated in a sense because it's very meta and it's very of the time that this album was released in the type of stuff that mark bolin and david bowie were doing back in the day wouldn't turn any heads today but you have to think about just how close-minded a lot of people would have had to have been back in the 70s not only to just be blatantly rejecting homosexuality but just the mere stage show that artists like Bolin and Bowie were putting together. So yes, this is one of many moments where David Bowie is just reflecting on the image of glam in the public's perception. David Bowie dives directly into the idea of rock stardom on the song Star, which I guess in a way is still space themed since star, space, Ha ha ha. But lyrically, David Bowie portrays a rock star as something to transform into, mutate into. And it's not only something that he wants, it's like he needs it as well. Because by the end of the track, he's telling us that he'd be able to sleep at night if he was a rock and roll star. He'd be able to fall in love if he was a rock and roll star. The song Hang On To Yourself uh, isn't one of the more lyrically intriguing moments, although we do get a direct reference to the Spiders from Mars on this track, which is Ziggy Stardust's backing band, uh, which he addresses directly on the very next track. But this song is pretty awesome because it features these punky guitar riffs that feel like the, the, something that would have come off of like a New York Dolls record, just So while Bowie was an artist who very blatantly borrowed from a lot of his contemporaries, uh, he was also an artist who in a lot of respects was ahead of the curve. Now Ziggy Stardust song uh, isn't really this heroic entry uh, in any sort of way. Uh, in, in this track, uh, Bowie explores fame even deeper, and in a way, uh, the fame that Ziggy Stardust has received due to just being so great at guitar and being a great musician has kind of poisoned him, because by the end of the cut, uh, he's sucked up into his own ego, and the band ends up having to be uh, broken up, because as David Bowie sings in the song, he's taking it too far, which eventually leads us to his is, uh, I guess in a sense his rock and roll suicide that ends the album off. Because even though David Bowie has portrayed stardom and fame as this wonderful beautiful thing for much of this record, something that he very much wants and very much needs, uh, the star that has risen on the album now needs to fall. Because on this record, uh, <laughs> this song is essentially the curtain closing on Ziggy. And it is a very epic curtain close as it really feels like uh, on this cut um, that just the spotlight is on the character that Bowie is playing. You know, Bowie, one of those artists who, uh, one of the earliest examples I could think of who in his music, when he's singing, it really feels like I'm listening to a stage show. It feels like I'm listening to a singer just 
on a hot spotlight and he's delivering not only uh, just great singing and great lyrics, but also a, a performance on a theatrical level. And sure, there have been many artists who have played characters in their songs over the years and have told great stories in their songs over the years, but uh, I feel like Bowie, more than any of those other artists who came before him, uh, embodied this sense of drama and theater in his music like to the extreme. Especially at the end of this track as he's just shouting, give me your hands, give me your hands. And just before a big rush of instrumentation, oh love you're not alone. A really beautiful and dramatic finish to this beautiful and dramatic and very meta and self-referencing album. Uh, an album that when you really get into the lyrics, again, uh, David Bowie makes some interesting statements on the artistic and the musical politics of the time in relation to glam rock. And in a way, art and public image and sexuality too. All these things I think continue to make Ziggy Stardust an interesting and a relevant and an influential record. Uh, sure, the music is fantastic. I mean, it's beautiful, gorgeous rock music with, again, that extra instrumentation which is added into it so tastefully doesn't take away from the viscera and the excitement of the bass instrumentation of the bass guitar and the guitars and the drums and the vocals. And then on top of that, many of the statements on fame, which I think are very relevant on this record to this day. Themes that have not only been explored again and again and again by countless rock stars such as Marilyn Manson, uh, but also many rappers today are now going through a very similar meta cycle where you have a lot of rap albums from artists like Kanye West and Drake and Kendrick Lamar, where they're essentially rapping about their own fame, but also about how it's not really all it's cracked up to be. But what's funny is that some of these statements are put so subtly, or at least they're buried in hooks and choruses and instrumentation that are so beautiful, unless you were really looking for David Bowie to be saying these things, you might sort of miss it. Which is why I urge people who may even be, you know, familiar with this album instrumentally and really love the sound of this record to, next time you're listening to it, uh, dive a little bit further into what David Bowie is saying and think about the time in history in which he is saying it. And I think I'm gonna leave this album review uh, right there. Uh, yes, a lot of cool contextual things about this album that I feel like we uh, addressed here. Cool narrative, awesome lyrical concepts, and uh, above all, wonderful music, wonderful rock music, wonderful instrumentation. And um, I hope you give this record a shot if you haven't listened to it already. You're the best. Ah! Uh, Anthony Fantano, David Bowie, Ziggy Stardust, Tran. Zishin. Thanks for watching the review. Check out some of the other reviews over here. Rest in peace, David Bowie. You're the best. Anthony Fantano. Music. Forever.